Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I want to discuss permutation operators in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. As the name suggests, permutation operators exchange particles with each other. But why do we care about exchanging particles? When we study systems of many identical particles, from atoms to molecules to materials, then when we exchange any two particles, the physics stays exactly the same. The mathematics to describe these multiparticle systems needs to capture this symmetry on the particle exchange, and it is precisely what permutation operators allow us to do. So let's learn about them. To study permutation operators, we need to start by looking at what a permutation is. Loosely speaking, a permutation is a rearrangement of a sequence of ordered elements. To look at a concrete example, let's consider a permutation of the three elements. The permutation is typically represented by the symbol P, then we list the elements 1, 2 and 3 in order, and the permutation rearranges these elements to, for example, this new order 3, 1, 2. To illustrate what we're doing, let's place three boxes like this. And let's label them box 1, box 2 and box 3. Then let's place a red ball inside box 1, a green ball inside box 2 and a blue ball inside box 3. This is our starting point here. So what does the permutation 3, 1, 2 here tell us? It tells us to place the boxes again, but now in the order 3, 1, 2. After this, we place the balls as they were, first red, then green, and then blue. So in this language, the permutation tells us how to rearrange the boxes. We can view the same permutation from a different point of view, in which we rearrange the balls rather than the boxes. Let's start by insisting that the three boxes are ordered 1, 2, 3 like at the very beginning. In this language, the first entry tells us to take the ball in box 1, in this case the red one, to box 3, so we place it there. Then the second entry tells us to take the ball in box 2, the green one, to box 1, so we place it there. And the third entry tells us to take the ball in box 3, the blue one, to entry 2, so we place it there. These two interpretations of a permutation are entirely equivalent. You can see how at the end, box 1 has the green ball in both cases, Box 2 has the blue ball in both cases, and box 3 has the red ball in both cases. Feel free to use whichever way of thinking works best for you. As we will see in a moment, when we talk about quantum states of multiparticle systems, the boxes represent the state space associated with the particle, and the balls represent the specific state in which that particle is. These two views then become equivalent to the statement that the order doesn't matter in a tensor product. Before we move on, we will simplify the notation for permutations to capital P and then the subindex 3, 1, 2, only specifying the end position because we will always take the initial position to be ordered as 1, 2, 3, so there is no need to specify it every single time. These ideas generalize to permutations over any number of elements, and for n elements, there are n factorial possible permutations. To move from permutations to permutation operators, let's stick with the case n equals 3. Consider a tensor product state space V of three particles, and construct a basis for this space in the usual manner using the tensor product. There are six permutations of three elements, and we can explicitly write these six permutations of three elements like this. We are now ready to define the permutation operators associated with these six permutations via their action on basis states. The permutation operator P, M, N, P, acting on the basis state ui1, uj2, uk3, is by definition equal to uim, ujn, ukp. What we're doing is moving the particle associated with state space v1 to state space vm, the particle associated with state space v2 to state space vn, and the particle associated with state space v3 to state space vp. This interpretation is equivalent to the one we discussed earlier in which we were moving the boxes, so that boxes are equivalent to state spaces. Balls are equivalent to states u, and you should convince yourself that you can also view the action of the permutation operator as moving the balls. Let's consider p123 as an example. It acts on the basis state, then we write the state in the same order without the state space label, and then the sequence 123 tells us to write 123 here. Essentially nothing changes when we apply p123, so it is in fact the identity operator. If we look instead at P231, and again consider the action on a basis state, then we first write the states, and then the sequence 231 tells us to write 231 here. 
Remember that the order doesn't matter in the tensor product as long as we identify each state with the correct single particle state space, so we can rewrite this as uk1, ui2, uj3. If you try to go from the original state here directly to this state here, you will see that it is equivalent to moving the balls in the demonstration we started with. As you can imagine, for an n-particle system, we define the corresponding n-factorial permutation operators in a similar fashion. The next definition that we need is that of a transposition. A transposition is a permutation that exchanges two elements and leaves the rest invariant. Sticking with the n equals 3 case, let's write out again all six elements. In this example, p132 is a transposition because it exchanges 2 and 3 but leaves one invariant, and you should convince yourself that p213 and p321 are also transpositions. By contrast, the other three elements are not transpositions. For example, we have already seen that p123 is the identity operator, so it isn't a transposition because it doesn't exchange any elements. Transpositions have some nice properties. First, they are Hermitian. Second, they are involutory, which means that they are their own inverses. And third, combining the first two properties means that transpositions are unitary. To prove these three properties of transpositions, we're going to use the simplest possible transposition as an example, coming from a two-particle system with n equals 2. For n equals 2, we only have two possible permutations, p12 and p21. p12 is the identity, so it is not a transposition. p21 is the operator that exchanges the two particles, which means it is a transposition. What we're going to do is to use p21 as an example transposition to prove these general properties of transpositions. The first property is that p21 is involutory. This means that it squares to the identity operator, or put another way, it is its own inverse. To see this, consider the action of p21 squared on a basis state. We apply the first p21 to exchange the particles once, and then we apply the second p21 to exchange the particles back. Comparing this term here with this term here, we confirm that p21 squares to 1. In other words, exchanging two particles twice leaves us back where we started. The second property is that it is Hermitian, so that p21 dagger is equal to p21. To see this, consider the matrix element of p21 between two basis states. Acting with p21 on these basis states, we obtain this permutation, we can then calculate the scalar product in the usual way by combining the states in v1 and the states in v2, and we get this. Now consider the matrix element of the adjoint operator p21 dagger. We know that the adjoint operator acts on the bra, so we obtain the permutation of the bra. We can then calculate the scalar product again, and we get this. These two expressions are the same, so p21 dagger is equal to p21. The third property is that p21 is unitary, so that p21 dagger equals the inverse of p21. This actually follows trivially from the first two properties, as the operator is both Hermitian and its own inverse. I will not go on, but essentially these three properties generalize to transpositions for any n, and the proofs work in exactly the same way as they work for p21. Now that we know about permutations and transpositions, we come to a very important observation. Every permutation operator can be written as a product of transposition operators. I will not prove this statement, but instead use a permutation p312, which corresponds to n equals 3, as an example. Note that p312 is itself not a transposition because it affects all three elements. To illustrate this, I will use boxes and balls again, and now I will take the view of moving the balls so that the boxes are always fixed in the order 1, 2, 3. As such, I will omit the box indices for simplicity and simply draw the three boxes as shown here. I pick the initial configuration of the balls as red, green, blue. Then, applying the permutation p312 moves the ball in box 1, the red ball, to box 3, so red here. Then, the ball in box 2, the green one, to box 1, so green here. And then, the ball in box 3, the blue one, to box 2, so blue here. Let's go back to the original configuration here. I can reach the same answer by first applying p321, which is a transposition because it exchanges 1 and 3, but leaves 2 invariant. And then I can apply another transposition, p213, which exchanges 1 and 2, but leaves 3 invariant. 
This final configuration is the same we got here, so we can write P312 as the product over these two transpositions. This decomposition is not unique. Let's set up the initial configuration again. We can do the same by first applying the P213 transposition that exchanges 1 and 2 and lists 3 invariant, and then the P132 transposition that exchanges 2 and 3 and lists 1 invariant. This means that P312 is also equal to this. Okay, let's set up the initial configuration yet again. We can now apply P132, then P213, then P132, and then P213, and we get to the same answer. This means that P312 is also equal to this product of four transpositions. We see that we can have different numbers of transpositions for a given permutation, for example here we have two and here we have four. It turns out that for a given permutation, the parity of the number of transpositions is fixed. For example, for P312 we can only have an even number of transpositions. Two transpositions in these two examples, or four in this one. But you could never have a not number of transpositions for P312. The parity of the number of transpositions in which you can write down a given permutation is called the parity of the permutation. So P312 is an even permutation. Now that we know that the permutation can be written as a product over transpositions, we can use the properties of transpositions to figure out a few additional properties of permutations. To do this we will consider a general permutation P alpha, where alpha is simply a label to identify a permutation. So for example, in the case of n equals 3, it can take any of the six sequences of numbers that provide the six corresponding permutations. In a similar fashion, I will specify transpositions as t beta. The first property is that permutations, like transpositions, are unitary. To see this, write a permutation p alpha as a product over n transpositions. Then calculate the adjoint of the permutation p alpha dagger, which is equal to the product of the n transpositions, all dagger. We know from the properties of the adjoint operator that this gives the adjoints of the terms in the product in reverse order like this. Additionally, because transpositions are unitary, each t beta dagger is equal to t beta minus 1, so we can write this as the reverse product of inverses of the transpositions. We're now ready to calculate the product of the adjoint permutation with the permutation itself. It gives this long product of terms, and in this long product the transpositions come together in the middle with their inverse because we reverse the order when calculating the adjoint. This term gives the identity, then these two terms come together and also combine to give the identity, and repeating this for all of them sequentially leads to an overall identity. This implies that p alpha dagger is the inverse of p alpha, so indeed all permutations are unitary. So does this result make sense? The inverse of a permutation is given by applying the sequence of transpositions in reverse order, and this is exactly what the adjoint here does. A second important property of permutations is that unlike transpositions, which are Hermitian, a general permutation may not be Hermitian. To see this we start with the adjoint of the permutation, then we pick this result up here for the adjoint, and use the fact that transpositions are Hermitian to write the adjoint of the permutation like this. But transpositions don't commute in general, so we cannot rearrange this sequence to get back to this original sequence for a general permutation. This implies that general permutations may not be Hermitian. The final property is that the adjoint of a permutation has the same parity as the original permutation. This is easy to see because we have shown up here that the adjoint of a permutation is simply the same sequence of transpositions in reverse order, so there are as many transpositions in the adjoint as in the original permutation. A word of warning. The final two slides include some advanced ideas that come from group theory, which is actually one of the reasons why I think today's video is particularly exciting. If you've encountered group theory before and you love it, great, you'll enjoy these last two slides. If you haven't, don't worry. I will explain everything that you need to know here, so you'll be able to follow the reasoning and you'll get the first taste of group theory. The last feature of permutations I want to look at is that the collection of all permutations for a given n form a group. We can look again at the n equals 3 case to exemplify this. Very briefly, for a group we need first an identity and we have already seen that the identity is p123 for n equals 3. Second, we need that the product of two group elements gives another group element. 
You can explicitly check this is true for all possible products, but as an example I will show here that P132 times P213 is equal to P312. To see this, act with the left hand side on a basis state. We first apply this permutation, and we get this, where I am using the move the boxes view. We then rearrange to bring the terms to the standard order before applying the next permutation. We then act with the second permutation, and we get this. And finally we rearrange again. Acting with the right hand side P312 on the same basis state, we get this. We can again rearrange to get this. Comparing both results here and here, we see that both terms are the same, confirming the product above. The third and final property of a group is the existence of an inverse for every element. With calculations like in this example here, we can show that the inverses of the group elements are given by these other group elements listed here. As I said earlier, if you're not familiar with group theory, that's fine. All we need moving forward in our study of quantum mechanics is what is called the rearrangement theorem. Imagine we order all group elements in a list like this. For an n-particle system we have n-factorial permutation operators and the list goes from 1 to n-factorial. I am using again the notation in which the sub-index is a label for a particular permutation rather than the specific permutation. Now if I pick an arbitrary group element, say p alpha, and multiply every element of the group by p alpha, I get a new list of group elements like this. What the rearrangement theorem says is that this second list contains each element of the group once and only once. So this operation of multiplying by an arbitrary group element simply rearranges the order of the elements, but doesn't lead to repeated elements. Another way of putting this is that both these lists have all n factorial elements, but simply in a different order. As I said earlier, for our purposes all you need to remember about permutation operators from these last two slides is what the rearrangement theorem says, so don't worry if you haven't encountered group theory before. Permutations play a central role when studying systems of quantum identical particles. You're now ready to learn about exciting topics including exchange degeneracy, bosons and fermions, all the way to second quantization. If you liked the video or would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.